Hello, and welcome to the International Wizard of Oz Club celebration of the 50th anniversary of Oziana. My name is Jim Vandernoot, and today we'll be exploring the 1987 edition of Oziana. And I will be reading to you uh, my story, Button Brights of, and the Nitwits of Oz, which was wonderfully illustrated by a very dear friend, Chris Sterling. Chris and I co-chaired the 1988 Munchkin Convention, and Chris's artistic passions and display skills made the event one of the most spectacular Oz conventions I've attended. And now, Button Bright and the Nitwits of Oz. Button Bright rubbed his eyes and blinked, and rubbed his eyes again. It was not the strangeness of his surroundings that startled the boy, but the suddenness of his arrival. Not a moment before, he had sprawled on one of the great lawns of Ozma's palace, idly chewing clover stems and thinking about how much he wanted a brand new sweater. Without so much as, as a hint of warning, the broad sky disappeared and the boy found himself staring up at bushy boughs of fragrant cedar interlaced with other evergreens. As he sat up and gazed around, Button Bright realized that he was lost. Now this might have worried another boy, but Button Bright had been lost so often that the unfamiliar was hardly unusual and merely meant that he was in for more adventures. Sooner or later, he would run into a familiar person or place, and then he would be found again. Lost or found, it was all pretty much the same to Button Bright. Strange as his surroundings were, their beauty at once captured the lad's attention. The pines above him formed the edge of a thick forest, in front of him, a meadow sloped down to a sparkling river. Occasional rocks broke through the surface of the water, but otherwise the river ran clear and deep. Through the rippling of the strong current, Button Bright could make out the flame orange forms of large goldfish. Flat stones lined the opposite bank, and a path led away through thickets of red tip bushes. Here and there grew clumps of hibiscus with their splashy crimson blossoms. Button Bright was entertaining the thought of finding his way across to pick some of the flowers when he spied a fawn standing in the shallows a few yards downstream. Her long tongue lapped eagerly at the clear water. Looking up from her drink, she gave the boy a deep, understanding look. Softly, she spoke. Even though we forest creatures always look after you, Button Bright, these woods are not very safe. You'd be better off if you follow the river downstream. How do you know who I am? asked Button Bright. We've all seen you before, replied the fawn. You've lost yourself in nearly every corner of Oz, and we've always looked out for you. With that, she turned and was gone. Button Bright was a bit surprised at this interchange, for he had not expected to be recognized in such a remote area. But the encounter was soon forgotten as the boy wound his way downstream and became absorbed in washing, watching the fishes and flowers. Merry peals of laughter echoed from the balcony outside Ozma's sitting room. 15-2, 15-4, 15-6, and a pair of wizards for eight. How am I doing, TikTok? cried little Betsy Bobbin. 
You have won again, Betsy, replied the mechanical man, his copper body gleaming in the morning sun. I compute your score to be 124 with Ozma next at 118 and Dorothy with 111. That was a good game, Betsy, said Dorothy. You've become a real expert at cribbage in the last few months. Yes, indeed, agreed Ozma. We have time for another game before lunch, she continued, but it's getting a little breezy for cards, so maybe we should try Parchazi. It may seem unusual that a powerful fairy princess like Ozma should spend her mornings playing games, but on this particular day, the serious affairs of state had been disposed of early and there were neither distinguished visitors to entertain nor public events to attend. Thus, the ruler of the Land of Oz was able to relax and romp with her favorite friends. As was customary on such a bright, clear day, Ozma would pass the time in games and chatter with Betsy, Dorothy, Betsy Bobbin, Trot, and other friends who wished to join in. From the green marble balcony adjoining Ozma's marvelous suite, they had a splendid view of the palace lawns and gardens, and could see past the walls as far as the gates of the Emerald City. Pleasant breezes rustled the green linen curtains in the open doorways as they enjoyed the warmth of the spring sunshine. Today, the gusts were stronger than usual, and the cards were beginning to blow about. But we need four for Parchazi, objected Dorothy. How about you, TikTok? Would you play the fourth hand? That would not be fair, responded the clockwork man, shaking his head from side to side. I am a machine and could calculate the throw of the dice. Well, how about Button Bright, suggested Betsy. I saw him earlier lying in the garden. Just then the curtains of Ozma's sitting room flew apart and the patchwork girl came cartwheeling through the open doorway. Well, you won't find him there now, she declared. Oh, hello, Scraps. Where'd he go, asked Dorothy. At this question, the patchwork girl tossed her head, flashed her silver suspender button eyes, and cocked her pearly mouth into an odd smile. Button Bright is out of sight, Heidi high and Heidi tight, left and right and on and on, from the lawn the boy is gone. He's vanished, gone. But how, exclaimed Ozma. I was out on the lawn this morning going down to the Emerald Fountains when I spotted Button Bright lying on the ground staring at the sky. Here Scraps jumped up and sat on the balcony railing and kicked out her feet as she addressed the company. I wanted to creep up behind him and yell, boo! But before I got halfway there, he just disappeared. In conclusion, the patchwork girl sum somersaulted forward off the rail and across the terrace, popping up beside Ozma. The girls exchanged worried glances. Button Bright gets lost all the time, ventured Betsy, but he never just vanishes. Are you sure your eyes are sewed on straight scraps? The patchwork girl screwed up her cotton face and stuck out her tongue. My eyes may fall off sometimes, but when they're on, they work, which is more than can be said for most people, she returned haughtily. Ozma spoke up. If Button Bright did indeed disappear so suddenly, there must be magic involved. I think we had better look in the picture in the magic picture, she suggested, rising from the table. 
Sure, echoed Dorothy. We ought to find him real quick that way. Ozma led the way into her sitting room, where the group assembled in front of a green velvet curtain, which entirely covered one wall. When the pull of a golden cord, the curtain drew aside, disclosing a small painting in a gilt frame. Now this was one of the most important magical treasures in the land of Oz. Ordinarily it showed a pleasant country landscape, but if the viewer wished to see a particular person or place, the desired scene would be displayed. So when Ozma and the others wished to see Button Bright, the picture faded to a river scene. The girls gave a sigh of relief for Button Bright was safe on the bank, evidently preoccupied with gazing at the fishes. Pointing at the splashes of hibiscus on the opposite shore, Betsy exclaimed, he must be in the quadling country. All the bushes and flowers seem to be red. Yes, observed Ozma thoughtfully, even the fishes are reddish in color. Still, I wonder what could have happened to transport Button Bright so abruptly. All at once, TikTok began clicking excitedly. There is something very familiar about that place, he asserted. I believe I have seen a painting of it in the National Gallery of the Land of Ev but I never imagined it could be a picture from Oz. Dorothy shook her head doubtfully. You must be mistaken, TikTok. It's not likely that someone could cross the desert to paint such a picture and then bring it back. But what about Button Bright, Betsy reminded them. Shouldn't we get the magic belt and wish him home? No, decided Ozma. Button Bright seems safe enough for now. If we were to bring him back now, we'd be depriving him of a pleasant afternoon and maybe some interesting adventures. It will be time enough to wish him home this evening. Meanwhile, let's have our lunch here and we can keep an eye on him while we eat. So saying, Ozma rang the servant's bell and in, in scurried Jellia Jam. Hearing her mistress's wishes, the little maid scampered away and before long, a nice light lunch was served. There were platters of cold ham, cheeses and chicken salad with tall glasses of lemonade and strawberries and peaches for dessert. Through broad thoroughfares and small alleyways, Button Bright followed the nitwit. The whole city was paved with cobblestone so that not a blade of grass grew within the walls. These cobblestones were coated with the same shiny red enamel as the buildings whose wooden doors and shutters were ornamented with navy, orange, and gold designs in keeping with the spires and parapets. The total effect was to ca cast a cheerful rosy glow over the entire city. Everywhere, nitwits hurried about their business, sporting the same curious top knots, glasses, and sweaters. All the streets and pathways were carpeted with long oriental runners, and the nitwits kept to the carpets so as not to slip on the slick enamel of the cobblestone. Button Bright's guide finally dragged him puffing up the steps of a small house and knocked at the door. In short order, an elderly gentleman appeared and greeted them with a jolly smile. Welcome, Skane, welcome, he said, stepping out onto the front stoop. And what have we here? Odd little whip, his hair's yellowed and growing like weeds. And where's his sweater? 
No, no, Grandpa Gnit, he's a stranger, explained Skane. Ah, now I see, returned the old man. That's different, very different. He stepped back and raised a monocle to his eye to get a better look at Button Bright. Grandpa Gnit was the oldest of the nitwits Button Bright had yet seen. Like the others, his only hair was a woolly topknot, except that his was a rusty gray color. He wore the usual wooden knitting needles in his topknot and a red pullover in place of the customary cardigan. He had a kindly face, though, and his manner put the boy at ease. The first thing to do is to find him work, declared Grandpa Knit having completed his examination of the lad. What can he do? Shane shook, it, Skane shook his head. Sad, sad, this one. Can't even wool gather properly. Oh, he spins all right. Lots of wool, but the quality's spotty and, here the nitwit lowered his voice to a shocked whisper. Spins in colors. At this revelation, Grandpa Knit stiffened up. That'll never do. Can't have the boy ruining our sweaters. The whole kingdom will suffer if he spoils the product. Hmm, he pondered. Too young to row. He could learn to fish, maybe. Don't like fishing protested Button Bright, especially for sweaters. How come you can't get them in the store like back home? Well, my lad, returned the elder, elderly nitwit, I guess we'll have to take you to the king. He'll find something you can do. Good, good, the head wool gatherer agreed heartily. Leave him with me, Skane. I'll get him spruced up and take him to his majesty. Drawing the boy inside, Grandpa Knit shut the door and the other nitwits hurried on his way. The interior of the house was warm and cozy. Sofas and overstuffed chairs were draped with afghans and piled high with crocheted pillows. In one corner of the room was a wood stove and next to it, a table covered with a red and white knitted tablecloth. Two pots bubbled away merrily on the stove and the aroma reminded Button Bright how long it had been since breakfast. Grandpa Gnit seated the boy at the table and busied about at the stove. Can't see the king on an empty stomach, declared the old gentleman. I'm not the cook my dear wife was, but I manage. Grandpa Gnit sighed and continued stirring his saucepans. Twas I who founded this settlement, you know, years and years ago. And my wife, how lovely she was in those days. We were even the first king and queen. Not our idea, you know. Everyone wanted a king and queen, and oh, what a regal couple we made. Well, things changed. Time passed our, and our city grew, and we grew comfortably old. We wanted it that way, but my poor gal got fuddled just couldn't keep herself together, kept falling apart all the time. Button Bright thought he saw the old fellow brush away a tear as he bent over his kettle. And then Grandpa Knit continued, we had to send her away. Well, of course, a kingdom wouldn't be a real kingdom without a proper king and queen. So I retired and gave the job to Jack Card. He's a good man, Jack is, and a pretty good king too. Knows how to keep things running smoothly. 
As he finished his story, Grandpa Knit lifted the pots from the stove and served up hearty portions of a delicious stew and mashed potatoes. Hungry as he was, Button Bright barely said a word until the meal was over. The elderly man pulled out his monocle and looked the boy over critically. We'd better do our best to get you presentable for the king. I don't want to see the king, objected Button Bright. I want to go home. But my boy, you must see the king. That's all there is to it. And if he thinks you should go home, well, he'll have to decide that. But first, you need a sweater. You can't go anywhere without one. The boy brightened up as Grandpa Knit plodded off to the bedroom in search of his sweater. In a place where sweaters were the principal industry, he expected to have his pick of the best. In a few minutes, the elderly nitwit returned with a red and a one with one that had a yellow diamond pattern across the shoulders. Here, try this on for size, he said. But I wanted a blue one, pouted Button Bright. I want a blue one with green and purple snowflakes. A blue one? Sorry, boy, but we don't make them that way. You'll have to take red. Now, let's see about that hair. He seized Button Bright's yellow locks and pulled them to a bunch on top of his head. This gathering, he tied experimentally with a short length of yarn and then paused to examine his subject. Not really much better. So I guess we'll leave it the way it was. Well, lad, let's go see the king. So saying, Grandpa Gnit closed up the cottage and led the way through the streets. Button Bright closely behind, his eyes wide with excitement. Along the avenues, the nitwits stopped to gawk at the sight of the curious stranger. In a few minutes, the boy and his escort arrived at the palace, which was similar to the other buildings in construction. What set it apart was a large white dome in the shape of a darning egg and four red parapets at the corners. Six guards flanked the entrance, each wielding a shield and a lance that looked like a huge knitting needle. The the shields were burgundy in color, embellished with the Nitwit's national symbol. Two silver knitting needles crossed with a ball of scarlet yarn that looped up over the needles. The sentries stood stiffly at attention while Grandpa Gnit uh, ushered his charge into the throne room. At the end of this large hall, rose a carpeted platform, atop which the king and queen rocked to and fro in their golden bentwoods. Beside this platform was a lower dais upon which were seated two nitwit maidens. A portly chancellor stood before the throne, leaning heavily on a staff, which was shaped like a huge crochet hook. Their Majesties, King Jack Card and Queen Argyle, and their Highnesses, Princesses Pearl and Picot, boomed a portly nitwit page. Enough, Bindoff, retorted the king. We know who we are. Now who or what? The monarch cast a disparaging glance at Button Bright. Have we here? Bindoff waddled toward the visitors as quickly as his fat frame could move. After a moment's conference with Grandpa Knit, he leaned back on his staff and boomed, Grandpa Knit, your majesties, and the boy Button Bright. 
King Jack Card and Queen Argyle appeared much the same as the rest of the nymphs. The king's top knot was copper in color and a dark red cardigan hung from his shoulders, whereas the queen's hair was scarlet and her sweater pink. Both had turned up noses. Solid gold knitting needles protruded from their hair in contrast to the wooden ones of the general populace. The queen wore long earrings that Button Bright recognized as chains of knitting markers like those his mother used at home. The two princesses shared the turned up features of the elders. <clears throat> they both displayed smug and haughty smiles and whispered secretly to one another whenever anyone spoke. Button Bright grew increasingly uncomfortable under the suspicious stares of the king and queen. Grandpa Knit was explaining to their majesties the circumstances of the boy's arrival in the city and his unsuccessful attempt at wool gathering. Upon hearing how the boy had ruined his yarn with colors, her majesty knitted her brow in disapproval. Shocking, the boy should be cabled for this, she screeched. Look at him, all that hair and no place to stick his needles. That's it, my dear, let's cable him, exclaimed the king. What a splendid idea. We haven't cabled anyone in an awfully long time. Now what cabling amounts to, I can't say exactly but the mere mention of cabling aroused such horrified looks from the courtiers that it must be the worst punishment a nitwit wit can bear. Poor Grandpa Knit pleaded with the sovereigns and Button Bright burst out wailing, don't wanna be cabled, don't want to be cabled. A regular hubbub ensued until finally Bindoff pounded the floor with his staff. Silence, thundered the page. The sentence is passed. Let the lad be cabled. But sire, Grandpa Knit addressed King Jack, surely it is not the boy's fault. He is just a stranger and is not accustomed to our ways. After all, he tried his best at wool gathering. He just has a more colorful imagination than the rest of us. <clears throat> the king listened patiently to the revered old man. And after a minute's silence, Jack Card turned to his majesty, turned to her majesty. Colorful imagination, he says. Have we any use for such a thing, my dear? He could run the mixing machine. Send him to Fair Isle, shrieked the queen. Capital idea, rejoined King Jack, looking very pleased. With such an imagination, he should be fine at mixing colors. Oh, just Think of all the splendid new patterns he could weave into our sweaters. <clears throat> the nitwit monarch rubbed his hands with delight. Grandpa Knit tried to object, but it was too late. Bindoff quickly snatched up Button Bright and tucking the boy under a fat arm, strode quickly out of the hall. The boy struggled in vain as the chancellor dragged him down to the shore and thrust him aboard a waiting longboat. So quickly did the boat launch that there was no chance of escape. The top knotted crew rode so, fu rode so furiously that Button Bright lost his balance and passed the trip lying in the bottle of the vessel, bottom of the vessel. In short minutes, the boat reached the islet in the center of the lake and came alongside a little wooden dock. The captain pulled Button Bright to his feet and shoved him towards the pier. 
The boy turned around defiantly, but scads. All at once, the nitwits let out a war whoop and pulled all the knitting needles from their top knots. Without warning, they were upon him, jabbing and stabbing so that the boy was forced back along the dock. Button Bright tried to shield himself and even managed to grab one of the needles in the struggle. But before he could thrust back, the nasty creatures were off, hollering and jeering across the lake. With such peculiar goings on displayed in the magic picture, it was impossible to concentrate on a game of Parchazi. As the afternoon passed, the scarecrow and little Trot dropped by. Even the hungry tiger poked in his head, having heard about Button Bright's strange adventure from the palace cook. Everyone in the room watched fascinated as Grandpa Gnit led the boy through the Nitwit City and they all laughed heartily at the odd appearance of King Jack Card and his court. But as the nitwits transported Button Bright off to their desolate fair isle, Ozma began to show some concern. If those creatures attempt to harm Button Bright, we shall have to come to his aid, she reflected. Still, he does need to be taught a lesson, and an afternoon alone on that remote island may give him time to think about getting lost so easily. Dorothy shook her head doubtfully. I don't know what good it would do, she remarked. Nothing seems to make a difference to Button Bright. Oh, but maybe he'll get into some more adventures, Betsy interjected. And at least we might get to see that funny race again. Oh, she gasped as the picture showed the nitwits turning their needles against Button Bright. Never you mind, said the scarecrow calmly, chuckling at the girl's frightened expression. Button Bright may be careless, but he's pretty clever when he needs to be. You'll see. As the nitwits raced away across the lake, the scene in the magic picture showed Button Bright climbing towards the tin cabin atop the island. But before he reached the top of the hill, the door of the little hut opened and a bald, red-faced little man peered anxiously about. Now all of the watchers were astonished by this occurrence and TikTok in particular. The copper man began whirring and clicking and waving his arms crying, it cannot be, it cannot be over and over. Dorothy had to cover her ears from the noise. When at last he stopped with a spoing in mid-sentence, Betsy Bobbin clapped her hand to her forehead. Thank goodness, she sighed. It took a few minutes for the company to settle down after TikTok's outburst. Dorothy was the first to speak. I wonder what got into him, she exclaimed. Better not wind him up, advised Scraps. He's liable to grind his gears again. While the others chattered about TikTok's odd behavior, Ozma gazed thoughtfully at the scene unfolding in the magic picture. I wonder who that little man could be and how he came to that island, she mused. He certainly is not one of the nitwits. She had little time to ponder, however, for Jellia Jam swept in announcing the approach of Glinda the Good. The little Wizard of Oz had spotted the, sor the great sorceress's stork-drawn chariot winging its way toward the capital. This development troubled Ozma, for Glinda rarely called unannounced 
unless a dangerous situation threatened. With a worried expression, Ozma thanked the little maid and prepared to meet Glinda in the palace gardens. The rest of the company trailed along expectantly, leaving TikTok all but forgotten in the prince's, princess's boudoir. When the little bald man spotted Button Bright, his face lit up with surprise. Well, howdy be, he ejaculated. No yarn, no wool, just a plain old homespun boy. Welcome, lad. But tell me, whatever put you here? I'm from the Emerald City. I'm Button Bright. The boy broke into a wide smile. And so you are, acknowledged the bald-headed man with a smile of his own. And I am Regino Edison Smith, formerly of the land of Ev, painter, inventor, and alas, prisoner. I've been to Ev, remarked Button Bright, but are you really a prisoner? Yes, my boy, sighed Mr. Smith, and so, I'm afraid, are you. Sitting himself on a flat rock, the little man placed his hand on Button Bright's shoulder. For many years I've been here, a captive of the nitwits. You see, I've always loved to paint, and as the landscapes of Oz are among the most beautiful in the world, I love to paint them most of all. One day I was working in my studio in Evna on a large painting, fully life-size. A marvelous river scene it was. I had almost finished, but it needed something else. So I reached across the river to paint some flowers on the opposite bank and splash, in I fell. If that river had been anywhere but in Oz, I surely would have drowned, for I never learned to swim. Here in Oz, though, no one can be killed, so I simply sank to the bottom and drifted with the current until I was washed up on the shores of the Nitwit City. Upon hearing that I was a painter, they marooned me on this desolate island to run the color mixing equipment that puts the patterns on their sweaters. There's no escape, for if I should jump in the water, I'd merely wash up on their doorstep and they'd ferry me back before I could get away. At least I have the satisfaction that my designs are in fashion all over the quadling country, concluded the little man even if it is tiresome and lonely out, out here. Now, what's that you're holding, asked Mr. Smith, noticing for the first time the wooden shaft the boy was clutching. Oh, nothing, shrugged Button Bright. Just one of those hairpins. I grabbed it when they threw me out. Nothing? You call that nothing? The red-faced man shouted gleefully. Give it here, lad. You may have just found our way off this rock. Button Bright surrendered, surrendered the wooden knitting needle. Regino Smith ran his hand up and down the shaft. How nice and smooth, he crooned. What a comfortable grip. Oh, for a snip of sable. He fixed his eyes on his young companion and brightened. A knife? Would you have a knife? All boys carry a pocket knife. Done now. Button Bright dug his hands into his pockets, dragging out a tangle of twine, battered flowers, rubber bands, a rough red rock, and two Ozingo chips. He reached in again and extracted a worn eraser and a shiny silver pocket knife. 
dancing with delight, Regino grabbed the knife. All I need is a lock of your hair and a critical eye. Oh, we're almost free. He reached out towards Button Bright's head with a pocket knife. You sure it won't hurt? Absolutely, declared Mr. Smith. I'll be as gentle as a lamb. Well, okay, said the boy doubtfully. The pocket knife flashed in Button Bright's direction, and in an instant, Mr. Smith stood back, displaying a large blonde lock. The lad never felt a thing. The inventor sat down on a rock and meticulously carved a notch in the blunt end of the knitting needle. Into the notch, he fitted the hair, which then he trimmed into a fine point. At last, he held the implement at arm's length and squinted one eye. Not exactly professional, he admitted, but I've worked with worse paintbrushes. Now we need a canvas. Hmm. Ah, I can paint directly on the wall. Now how about a palette? Smith looked around but there was nothing in sight but rocks. Suddenly he snapped his fingers and dashed into the cabin. He returned a second later, carrying a metal folding chair. For years I've sat in this chair, working their miserable color coordinating machinery day after day. Since I won't be sitting there anymore, I guess it'll make a good palette. Let's see, where are those valves? Button Bright trailed along as Regino Smith searched up and down the maze of pipes that led from the rear of the cottage to the lake. After several minutes of combing every inch of the pipes, he shook his head in discouragement. I can't find the outlet valves. I know they're here somewhere, but it's been so long that I've forgotten where they are. Sure enough, half concealed under a rock at the water's edge was a row of spigots marked blue, green, orange, yellow, purple, pink, black, white. Mr. Smith crouched down on the dock, holding the chair under the valves, while Button Bright turned the knobs so as to give a dollop of each color and a huge blob of green. Now for your critical eye. Mr. Smith led the little fellow up to his canvas. Brush and paint fairly flew over the cabin wall and before long the rough green outline of a palace took shape. Regino chattered away as he worked. I visited the Emerald City once. I had heard it was ruled by a powerful wizard and I got curious. He wouldn't grant me an audience though. Ozma's the queen now, said Button Bright, and the wizard's a good chum. He can do almost anything. That's so. After a while, Regino Smith took a step back. Well, he asked the boy, how am I doing? The door's higher and Ozma's flags on top and there are more emeralds along the drive. The painter and the boy worked together in this fashion until they had a perfect image of Ozma's palace. With a final flourish, Mr. Smith tossed his brush in the air, took Button Bright by the hand, and calmly stepped onto the emerald pathway. Ozma, Betsy, and Dorothy came running onto the lawn, followed by Scraps, the Scarecrow, and Jellia Jam. Glinda's swan chariot was still a good distance away, but they waited patiently until it sailed gracefully to the ground 
and the powerful sorceress alighted. The Ozites could all see the worry in Glinda's expression. What is it, urged Ozma, her own fears aroused. I hope it is nothing, answered the good witch, but only this morning I read a most disturbing entry in the great book of records, and I am afraid one of our mortal citizens may have come into trouble. It said only this, Button Bright has picked a six-leaf clover and vanished from the Emerald City. Six-leaf clovers, as you know, have magic powers, and the magic in the hands of a mortal could bring great harm. I came so that we could try to locate him in the magic picture. Ozma breathed a sigh of relief. Dorothy laughed. So that's how he managed to disappear right in front of Scrap's eyes, she exclaimed. The patchwork girl was hooting and cartwheeling at the news, and amidst the excited cries of the girls, Ozma reassured the sorceress that Button Bright had been kept under close watch and was safe enough. She added, we were just about to get the magic belt and wish Button Bright home. Someone looking for me? At the sound of the little boy's voice, the entire party whirled around. There, indeed, was Button Bright. What a joyous homecoming it was. Button Bright introduced Regino Edison Smith, who became an instant favorite with all. The boy related the story of their escape from the fair Isle of the Nitwits, and Ozma began to doubt he would ever learn his lesson. Glinda graciously agreed to stay and celebrate. Betsy ran to wind up TikTok, and the Copper Man was happily reunited with his creator. The former partner in the firm of Smith and Tinker was delighted to see his clockwork man in such excellent condition. That evening, a marvelous feast was served in the best Oz tradition. As the guest of honor, Mr. Smith was seated on Ozma's right. TikTok was placed next to him so that the two could catch up on old times. To Ozma's left, were the wizard and Dorothy, and further on down the table, Button Bright chattered excitedly to Trot and Ojo the Lucky, who were eager to hear all about the nitwits. Glinda the Good graced the foot of the table with her stately presence. The Oz animals occupied their own special table, served by a dozen waiters. The hungry tiger consumed only 15 roasts. For, as he remarked to the cowardly lion, there would be ice cream and cake for dessert. After the meal, Ozma made a speech of welcome to Mr. Smith. Since your workshop in Ebna was abandoned so many years ago, she concluded, and since TikTok could benefit from the company and attention of his inventor, I hope you will consider making your home in the Emerald City as the Royal Painter of Oz. Whatever materials were left in your laboratory after Mr. Tinker departed for the moon could be brought here by means of the magic belt. Anything else you should need we will most gladly provide. Thank you, thank you, most gracious princess. Mr. Smith arose with a bow. It gives me great pleasure to accept your kind offer, for I already feel at home in the Emerald City. In all the world, no country has such beautiful landscapes as Oz. I only hope my paintings will do them justice and give pleasure to your highness. But before I begin painting, I have one task left to perform. 
For years, I served the nitwits mixing colors and preparing designs for their sweaters. Although they kept me against my will, I took pride in my craft and was pleased that my patterns were worn by folks all over Oz. Therefore, I will invent a new mixing machine, a wheel of color. It will be much prettier to look at than the tin cabin that now occupies the fair aisle, and will create an endless variety of designs from the patterns of the clouds and the sunlight on the water. The nitwits will no longer be obliged to keep a slave to do their color mixing, and their garments will be as fashionable as ever. Everyone applauded this speech, and the wizard proposed a toast to the royal painter of Oz. Several more toasts were made as dessert was served, and the royal orchestra played a sweet waltz. Scraps recited a new poem accompanied by such acrobatic contortions that the guests broke up with laughter. The scarecrow presented some new riddles he had thought up the night before, and the wizard dazzled the company by conjuring a fountain of emerald fireworks that seemed to flow from the chandelier overhead. The merriment lasted way into the night, and finally the guests excused themselves one by one, bidding Ozma good night. Mr. Smith's apartments had been prepared, and Jellia Jam led the way. Button Bright departed too, and so tired was he after the day's adventures that he didn't notice the mischievous smile that passed between Ozma and Dorothy. Up the marble staircase he dragged, eyes already half closed. Reaching his room, the boy was about to flop on the bed when he spied something folded on his pillow. It was a bright blue sweater embellished with green and purple snowflakes. The end. <laughs>